Canada's history? That's it? No society? Okay, all yours. Okay. okay, perfect. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I am not a historian, not a teacher, and that makes me perhaps uniquely qualified to be president of Canada's History Society and talk to you about archival collections. Um, in a way, I am going to represent the user today. And uh, I am going to talk at the other end of why you do all the important work you do. Ian asked me to talk about the uses of the archives and potential partnerships within the heritage community. But I think for most of you, uh, this is probably already apparent, or certainly sounds like that this morning. Canada's history uses archival materials almost daily in its magazines and in the books that we publish. Um, we also do that through our heritage fairs programs where students across the country are discovering their local archives as the best source for finding that, gee, I didn't know that story that gives them a leg up on the competition. Increasingly, we are looking to build our own archives of stories collected from readers and from the wider public. Canada's Great War Album is a book coming out this September that features never be foreseen photographs and letters from the collections of Canadians about their family's World War I experience. Our future focus will be putting it all together. Uh, here's another photo and image from that book. Um, uh, connecting research, classrooms, community, and personal experiences together. Uh, for example, here you'll see that there's a picture of what it was like in the trenches. In the Canadian Great War Experience, which is a project we currently have in development, students from across the country will research the men and women who served from their own communities. They will carry those identities to a five-day experiential learning event in Ottawa, where, among other things, they will simulate a day of regular army training, spend 24 hours in a trench, and culminate their experience with a service medal presented by the Governor General at the Canadian War Memorial. However, I'm happy to talk to you about all those projects um, in our time away from here, but in the now six minutes that I have left, um, I'd like to provide you with a glimpse of our reality, um, where we compete daily for greater popular interest. I hope um, I can underscore two very important recommendations for the pathway forward. Whatever way we choose, it has to fully engage Canadians, particularly young Canadians, and building the archival system of the future requires new funding paradigms that support an investment in the marketing and promotion of the archives as much as it does in the work of the archives itself. As Tom Nesmith wrote in his paper, the archives are not yet fully understood and supported strongly enough by society. Part of the reason for this is because, for the most part, probably present company excluded from what I'm hearing today, the archivists, indeed the heritage community, continue to operate mostly on the plane of traditional media, whereas the popular world has moved far beyond it. As you can see from the slide that I've left up there so you can read it, in a 2009 research study we commissioned, we discovered that half of the historical community, museums, archives, community organizations, were infrequent users of online new media, both at work and at home. And infrequent meant they used it once a year or less. Put another way, they were twice as unlikely as Canadians overall to embrace these technologies in their work or personal life. 80% of them said that the lack of staff time and training was the main obstacle to increase their use at work and that the best online resources we might provide to them would be the ones that they could access from home. Home, that place where 50% of them only go once a year or less. Now, I admit that the total number of users has probably increased over the last five years, and that's evident in the thought and thoughts and discussions here today, but I also contend this has probably not resulted in any narrowing of the gap between where everyday Canadians are and the historical community. Consider this. According to a 2012 study published in the American Medicine Association, in these same five years, media use has increased from six and a half hours to nearly seven and a half hours a day in children between the ages of eight and 18. Even more alarming, children have become master multitaskers, often using two or more media devices at the same time. Counting each device separately, these kids have found a way to cram in a total of 10 hours and 45 minutes of media content into those seven and a half hours. Whatever archive strategy you design, you're creating it for this digital native generation. Will any of us be able to keep pace with that? 
But it isn't just about <clears throat> where your audience is, it's also about where, what they do on these platforms. These new media technologies are also transforming um, pretty much, sorry, I've just lost my spot, we are transforming how we approach almost every aspect of our life. We know about its impact on music, on television, but I just wanted to give you another couple of quick examples. You can order your groceries from your cell phone. Nike doesn't just sell you a pair of running shoes, they are your coach and your online workout community. They're even teaching young girls the importance of a regular fitness regime. Anyone that's seen those recent Olympics ads knows that Procter & Gamble isn't selling you soap and detergent. They are in the business of moms. Well, making moms cry for sure. For me, the multimedia phenomenon most pertinent to our aspirations is me to we. Oh, I got Procter & Gamble, me to we. Who knew that international development could be so cool? For those of you with teenagers, you know this phenomenon already. Tens of thousands of teenagers, literally from the ground up, they do something locally, they do something individually, and it goes to a global initiative. They do volunteer work for the opportunity to listen to politicians, who wants to, social activists, and a few rock stars in hockey arenas across the country. It is perhaps the best and one of the fewest examples where the cause, not the corporation, is leading what the corporate community is now calling social enterprise. Companies are no longer just in the business of selling you something. They want to engage in their audience and they want to create connected ecosystems that motivate behavior. That may sound dangerous, but it's actually something good and it's important for us to understand. History and heritage have the potential to be the next Canadian social enterprise just because of the constellation of significant anniversaries ahead of us. In this fast-paced world, if you leave a void, somebody else is going to come along and fill it pretty quickly. Indeed, a quick Google search of Canadian history website returns over 525 million options, but nothing stands out. It's like 120 TV channels, but nothing's on. Ian Wilson has thoughtfully laid out the breadth and depth to which archives could, are being used online, but no one recognizes any of this as archival work. They don't even know what an archives is. Similar to Jack Jedwab's survey findings, our own revealed that more and more people are turning to the web when they're looking for, for history information, and 53% cite Wikipedia as their most popular website. So what we have here is a marketing and branding problem. Apparently, anyone can be a historian, and many are taking on that role. There are thousands of sites for historical digital collections emerging, some good, some bad. Rather than draw from Canadian examples, I picked some from other countries for you to look at. Things We Used to Do is a very charming UK site rooted in a popular platform called History Pen, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. But then you realize basically this site is a data mining project for a local energy distributor looking for some customer leads. That doesn't necessarily make it bad. Um, we still have this great collection of photos that would never otherwise be seen. But what constitutes history is changing as well. When I first started working on the Heritage Minutes over 20 years ago, we defined history as things that are happening 30 years ago or more. Now online, virtual monuments and archives are being erected almost as soon as events have taken place. Here's one on 9-11, which is uh, really well done, curated by, um, based in a university uh, in the United States. But here's another really interesting one. Hurricane Sandy just happened a year ago, and they've already got a huge collection of images and stories online. But what you, and what you see most often is the personalization of history. Whose history are we telling is something we've asked ourselves, we, we ask ourselves all the time. Today on the web, you can personalize your news, your shoes, your car, your dates. Our digital solution has to ensure that individuals can personalize their archival experience and put themselves into the story, whether that's wading through existing collections or by adding their own records to them. I know looking at it from the user and extending through to the user uses of the archives is something that runs counter to what you're looking at um, and counter to the traditional nature and habits of archivists, as Lois York observed in her report, um, where the focus is often on description, possibly to the detriment of preservation and access. But we have to bring the archives out of the past and demonstrate that it has a relevance to the present and the future. 
I'm intrigued by Durante and Rogers' suggestion of a Canadian archival cloud and Wilson's Heritage Consortium. They both could be rallying points for that social enterprise I speak about. They would demonstrate the value and contemporary relevance of archives, and they would be a project that this current generation, so often disconnected from historical issues, can own and become engaged and excited about. They know, that this, they know this world much better than any of us, and creating a new place for history, their history, the future of history, could well be the tipping point in shifting perceptions of the past, present, and future, and lead to greater stewardship of our historical records and greater care and attention to the needs of our archival community. So the question is one of financial capacity. I've heard a lot today about um, private sector partnerships and a con being a continuing source of malaise, but the archival community has to find a way through this because any successful endeavor is much bigger than you're estimating and it's going to require significantly more resources than the governments are going to be prepared to commit. Jack Jedwab referenced that only 27% of Canadians felt that archival funding should be solely funded by government. Canadians are growing accustomed to a larger role by the private sector in social causes, and as you may have noticed from all the examples that I've shown you today, the most successful ones are not government-led. Perhaps it is the offset to all this mass customization, but consumers, Canadians, are growing more demanding in their desire for more meaning, more connectedness, and more belonging in their daily lives. That's what corporations are responding to, and they're made up of individuals as well. They're looking for partnerships that can help them create that social call to connect and take action to make change. So here's our opportunity. Over the coming five years, Canadian history will be the cause celeb, not just for the country, but also for many companies older than Canada who are celebrating milestones and anniversaries of their own. Our banks, breweries, newspapers, insurance companies, and our major department store all have, make, all have a stake here. They also all have archives of their own. None are publicly accessible online, and they're concerned about their future records as well. And they all have a desire to be part of exactly this type of social enterprise. Putting that together requires a much more concerted investment to promote the purpose and the capacity and the expertise of the archives themselves. Canadians are indeed concerned about the future of the past and the future of their records. They need only consider their own personal habits regarding documents, letters, and photographs to have a grasp on that issue. But they have not yet been persuaded about the role the archives might play in resolving these concerns. The archival community needs to seize this opportunity for leadership. But you have to think collectively and you have to think differently. Uh, someone once told me in the world of fundraising, it's not about your lawn, it's also about their grass seed. People, and it's people who run companies, and people who run governments, and individuals, I think, that would rally behind this too. People want to support solutions and opportunities. They do not want to support problems. I know that Ian is deeply concerned that we focus on ideas that are realistic, and I know all of this may seem overwhelming and fantastic relative to the many immediate tasks and pressing concerns that you have, but this too is reality. This is the world we're all living in, and the place of history and archives in it is largely hidden and misunderstood. In this world, you're going to have to think big. You're going to have to be bold. We have to find our place in this world or the gap between the present and the past will become so vast that the world of history will be completely unrecognizable. The vision for the way forward cannot be incremental, even though we may have to create many steps to get there. But I know we can do it. After all, we have time on our side. <laughs>